Hi, Shalom Rastafari. I want to speak on Nibiru, Nibiru, and the connection with the star, what's known from from our Ethiopic sources as the star of doom and gloom, or the Kokeb, Kokav in the Hebrew, Bamarinya, the Kokeb, which is the star of the eighth millennium from Ethiopic sources it's known as the star of the eighth millennium now this is a, um this is a picture right here this is a very interesting picture and we're going to use this particular um picture to describe Nibiru and this is very interesting um if you look at this particular image now when you look through ancient Egypt sources you find some very interesting correspondences so we're going to speak on Aaron and the golden calf as well in this particular um, presentation now notice if you will as we point out right here notice if you will the so-called um, horns of the bull now of course first of all let's deal with some of the disinformation the misinformation because we have to get over the disinformation, the misinformation to get to a more accurate interpretation of the Bible and of these symbols. And now with more technology and we, we know that certain things are happening in the heavens, there are certain heavenly signs that are being recorded and witnessed and, and verifiable. We want to put this together as best as we can. So we're going to, first of all, let's go to the scriptures. Let's go to um, let's go to chapter thirty-two of the book of Exodus. Now, if you recall, that was the golden calf, what's known as the golden calf, or your work, Tidja uh, missal, or the image of the golden calf. So let's go to the top. And let's begin right here. This is Exodus chapter 32, uh, verse 35. And it reads, And when the people, and when the people saw that Moses, Musa, he delayed to come down out of the mount. No doubt you recall whether you've seen in the movies or you maybe somewhat familiar, Moses goes up to the mountain to get the laws from God on the mountain. There's thunders, there's lightnings, all right, um, which are signs of God, but not really uh, explained in the modern way that we will look at it. What is causing, is it just a storm, or is there some extraterrestrial, there's some, some other superimposition, at this particular time. We'll touch on that as well. So the people, the children of Israel, the Beit Israel, as well as the mixed multitude, remember those are mixed multitude, and these particular um, um, terminologies must be explained a little bit better. So we have the children of Israel, we have the Hebrews. Remember when when God, when when the God that revealed himself or itself to Moses revealed itself it said that it is the God of the Hebrews often we hear the Jewish God or we hear even the God of Israel but that's not how the God identifies himself all right so we have the children of 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 the Hebrews we have the Hebrew children we have the Beit Israel and we have this mixed multitude so we, we need to define, well, who are these people in relation with the context of ancient Egypt based on the available data and information that we have today. So anyway, verse 1 of chapter 32, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, so he spent longer than, than they expected, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods, which shall go before us, for as 
for this Moses, this particular Moses, this is interesting, this Moses, what kind of language is that, this Moses? It's like saying, uh, as for this president or this leader or this brother or that brother, this is the sort of language. Because see, in the Ethiopic, Muse, Moses or Muse is actually a title uh, head of a fraternal order in the Ethiopic, Muse. All right? Take a note of that as well. So this will explain and this will agree with this context right here. This Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. In other words, we don't know what has happened to him because he hasn't returned. He hasn't come down. Now, this is another translation from the NET right here that kind of brings this more out. They add fellow here, but they say, and fellow is a brother, for this brother Moses, this brother Musa, this Wendem Musa, right, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become, in other words, what has happened to him. So now, here we have the, the Hebrew, right, the Hebrew of it, but let's just deal with the basic English King James translation firstly and foremostly. So it says, And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings. So they had golden earrings. So they were wearing earrings, right? Which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them to me. So the the males, the females, and the wives all had earrings, golden earrings, right? So he said, break them off. In other words, break them off. Break break off a piece, like break it off, right? And the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Haron or Aaron. So they brought all the gold to him. Verse 4, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a what? A gravening tool. Right, a gravening tool. Now, remember the difference between the Hebrews, in the sense that the religion or the way of the Hebrews and the Egyptians of that period of time, was that the Hebrew interpretation. Because we have to remember the similarity of symbolism. That the symbolism of ancient Egypt was clearly known to Moses. He was learned in all the mysteries. You understand? He was learned, so this was clearly known to him. So when we look at these images, do we know what he knew, and do we see it the way he sees it? And we need to use the scriptures and the available data to begin to piece this once again together. So he fashioned with a gravening tool after he had made a what molten calf, and they said these. This is interesting. He said he didn't say this. But he said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So he fashioned this. So let's see if we can get an accurate an accurate um picture. An actual accurate picture of this. I think we have some images here on file that we can bring up um that can give us an accurate image. Though there's a lot of images of the golden calf in circulation, but what we are looking for is an accurate image. Remember, it's a golden calf. Often, what gets shown to people is a is a so-called golden is a golden cow. All right? What usually gets to be shown to people is a golden cow. What we're looking for is an image that would be of the so-called golden of the so-called golden um, calf. Let's see what, this is some Nibiru images. We don't want to go ahead of ourselves right here. Um, let's, let's see if we have this right here. Moses, 12th Dynasty, Egypt, a very, a very interesting um, file as well. Um, let's... Uh, Okay, here we go, over here. We have it over here. So what's often shown is a cow. However, from our research, this will be the more accurate image of 
what's a golden calf? Remember, it's not a cow, but it's a calf would have looked like. All right? A golden calf, what it would have looked like. So it is something to this effect that Aaron, with his gravening tool, engraving and made for the children of Israel and said, now notice what he said. He said, these be, right, these be. Now, we're told that it was a calf, right? On one hand, we're told that it was a calf. And then we have Haron or Aaron saying, these. Have you, have you paid attention to that? From the, based on the Masoretic, we're looking at the Hebrew, right? Based on or the traditional, Masora means tradition, the tradition of the Hebrews, of the Ihud, of the Jews, right? Of the Ayus, of the black Jews, tradition of the Hebrews, Masora. It says that these be, now if it's a calf and it's these, that means that we have to interpret this in the sense that each of, that, that there are certain significant aspects which can be taken separately or taken together. The point we was going to make is um, that the religion or interpretation of spirituality in Egypt at this time from the ephemeral, the ephemeral, in other words, where it is an experience, you see, had become objectified. And this is where the idolatry, this is why the one of the first of the words spoken to the Beit Israel in Exodus chapter um, 20, which is called like the Ten Commandments, Jah's Law, the pure, the pure um, word, the, the will of God, the pure law, the command, the Tizaz, the mitzvah. See, the ten so-called commands are really one command. It's the ten words. There are ten articles, ten aspects. This is why Yaakov or James say in his epistle in the New Testament, if you break one, you break all. Because they are, they are like ten, you could say, parts of one contractual agreement. You understand? Or one command, one word. All right? You have to keep that in mind because otherwise... You're not going to see the full sense. If you look at it as ten commands, ten different commands, you're not seeing it in the, its proper revealed aspect. And this is what's happened in the Western Gentile world and in mistranslation, Western white European mistranslations called the Ten Commands. But clearly, according to the text, it is one command, ten words, ten articles, ten parts. All right? And the first... And second, main parts of it forbids what we would call today idolatry. That means, well, that's thought to mean worshiping an image. Now, what's very interesting is that the Hebrews and Moses is, is, the, is the point man for this, this new interpretation, this new consciousness or returning to the original intent where it is an experience for the Hebrews, and it's not an object, because this always kind of um, this always kind of um, bothered me a little bit about this area of scripture. It might bother some of some of y'all, and you, you'll you'll say, okay, Aaron, this golden calf, he did it. Maybe the people pressured him. Maybe the people forced him. But then, how come he wasn't punished in the same way? That the Israelites, well, okay, he's the brother of Moses, so that might be one of the reasons why he's not given the same sort of punishment. Now, that would seem to be logical, but under further inspection and review, that would be, that is a logical fallacy. In other words, most people think, well, look, Aaron, he makes the calf, right? He makes this particular golden calf, which the people worship, right? But the people um, are put to the, the sword by the Levites. So this is one popular um, um, image we can say of the golden um, calf. This is another, another view, another perspective of the golden calf, right, that Aaron, that Aaron made for, for, for the people. 
so we can say maybe this is is this an Aaron type figure? You understand? Or perhaps Aaron is not figured here. And this is the this is the people now worshiping because Moses didn't return. Moses didn't come down from the mount in the time that they expected. So they felt that we didn't know, you know, that we don't know what happened to him. So we need to, you know, keep moving. You understand? So we see a lack of patience, impatience, right, leading to disobedience. And that impatience leading to disobedience ultimately leads to death, right? And there was the people, instead of going forward, because they heard the command and they said, we will hear and we will do. After Moses doesn't come down, they don't see Moses around anymore. It's like they retrograde. And, 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 and on a theological or spiritual level, you know what I'm saying, or even a spiritual evolutionary level, they devolve. They don't continue the forward revolution, but they basically retrograde and they go back to what they were familiar with. So now Aaron, right, Aaron says that these be the gods that brought you up out of Egypt. But wasn't it Yahweh that, did, did he sin by saying this? It would seem so from a Western white Gentile from the perspective that most of us are approaching it initially. It will seem, it seems as though Aaron, he erred because he's saying that it's, it's, these are the gods that brought you up. These are the gods that brought you up. This, this golden calf right here is what brought you up out of Egypt. But then when the judgment comes down, right, when the judgment comes down, now furthermore, look what Aaron says here in verse 5. And when Aaron, Haron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation. He made a, a watch. He made even a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast, a feast, a festival. To Yahweh. So that's like saying to the folks, you know, you know, tomorrow's a party. We're going to have a feast, a festival, a celebration to the Lord. So is this incongruous here that he's saying a feast to the Lord or to Yahweh? And then he then fashions this particular, this particular calf right here, this um, molten image he fashions, right? He says, um, let's just forward it, uh, rewind it right here. He said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up. But wasn't it Yahweh who brought them up? So what's the connection between this? You see, the mystery of Egypt, the ancient um, Kamite, Mishtia, overstood from its root. Uh, Ethiopic perspective will explain this, and hopefully we'll be able to also further explain the connection with the golden calf, right, in that particular day and time, and the golden calf in this present time, 2012, and the sign of Nibiru or Elanine, the, the star of doom and gloom, the Kokeb star of the eighth millennium. All right, so verse 6 here says, And they rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings. So now the next day they rose up early, excuse me, early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Now, it's very interesting because up until this time, there's no legislation on burnt offerings or peace offerings. There's no description. After this time, we get a description. We're in the book of Leviticus in this present period right now, and we're, go we're, we're, we're going through um, many different descriptions of the main five types of different sacrifice and how these are types of the perfect sacrifice of, of Yeshua HaMoshiach, of the Moshiach, of Christos, of Christ, even Christ in his kingly character. But here at this particular point in Exodus 32 and 35, we actually have them going through burnt offerings and peace offerings. So they were already familiar with burnt offerings. It wasn't a new thing, but it's the context, as we mentioned about salvation, it's the perspective. As we said, for the Hebrews, 
why Yahweh is the God of the Hebrews, because they have crossed over from that objectified, which becomes even idolatry, form of so-called symbolism, and actually are experiencing, you understand, what the symbolism, what the symbols actually imply. So the symbols here originally were meant interpretively, but as people, um, as 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 people, uh, how can you say, did not did not grow, but basically retrograded in their consciousness because of we can say original sin, and what's original sin because of ignorance, because of not understanding the true faith, the true interpretation remain amongst a few. And these are the Hebrews, because the Hebrews, even in ancient Egypt, was a particular class of, some say, a class of priests, and some say it was a particular religion or a religious, like we have Christianity today, and we have a lot of different denominations. People say, I'm Christian, I'm Christian, I'm Christian. You understand? But they believe sometimes vastly different things depending on their denomination. So they all identify, in a sense, with Christ, you understand? But how Christ is interpreted and then how that dictates how they, how they act, how they live. Some don't experience anything truly in Christ. It is basically similar to this golden calf. It's an idol. You understand? They see it, they look at it, and they feel, well, by and by, I'll be all right after I die. But they don't really experience it. So it's no longer ephemeral. It is no longer an experience. He who feels it knows it. It becomes objectified, and then therefore becomes an idol. Yovas, all right. Now, with that being said, let us go forward. Right? Let us go forward. So, it says right here that they rose up early, early in the early on the morrow, early in the next day, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. Now. This particular phraseology is interesting because we'll find the same kind of phraseology speaking of the end times where the people, they focus on and they should be eating and drinking, right? Is this, is, is, it's like Noah, what happened in the time of Noah, the days of Noah. They shall be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. So we even have this whole so-called um, same-sex homosexual falsely called gay marriage and there's no longer happy marriages among heterosexuals is there is this a coincidence there, is there more to it so the even the idea of the word gay it really means happy it always meant happy if you read older literature sometime in this modern time laws and times have been changed, have been perverted. It's like a spell. It's like grimoire. It's like grammar. Changing words, concepts, what it means, taking it from its true etymological meaning to another meaning. But that's, that's another reasoning. That's another reasoning there that hopefully we'll, we'll present in another lecture. But right here, this language here is very interesting. Make a note of it. The people sat down to eat and to drink right, eating and drinking, and rose up to play, taking life as a toy, as a plaything, not recognizing or realizing the true purpose of life, you understand, and, and this earth, and this schoolroom, this classroom, you understand, the true purpose of spirituality, you understand, the true consequences in this world and the world to come of our actions, and moreover, of our consciousness in tune with our actions, whether, whether we have debt, negative karma, or whether we have good karma, barakat, blessing. Now, verse 7, in 32 and 7 here says, And Yahweh said to Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Now, notice something. I don't understand to the people that, that this, this uh, calf, this tija, this word tija, misal, yihichnat, right? That this particular symbol, right, this particular calf is your God, is your God that brought you up out of Egypt, right? Now, Yahweh, 
right? The Lord, if you please, Yahweh here says to Musa, right? This Moses, right? Go, get thee down. And it was come down off of this mount now. You, you know, this was a close encounter. You know, Moses was up on the mountain in a close encounter, right? For thy people, which thou, Yahweh says that Moses, you, you male, you brought, you brought us them out of the land of Egypt, but they have now what corrupted themselves. They have cheapened themselves. They have devalued themselves. In other words, they have gone backward. You understand? They've lacked patience. You remember in Revelation what it says? It says that patience is the what? The imminent of the Kedusan is the faith. faith. Patience is the faith of the saints. Is the confidence. Is the trust. Because they know the truth, so they can be patient. They recognize the cycles. They recognize that um, what you sow, you reap. You understand? And they recognize that they must till their garden. You understand? They must till the good ground in order for the seed, the word, to be most effective. But these, right, have corrupted themselves. They've cheapened themselves. They've devalued their spiritual currency, their spiritual current, in other words, because no longer were they walking in the experience. Now they needed an object. You understand? So they fell from, it's that one-third of the heaven, you know, spirit, soul, and body, that one-third that on the physical because they lost the true spiritual, the true psychological, you understand? And now they became, you know, now they became... um idolatrous. They went backward, in other words. No longer in the experience, but they needed to objectify it. You see, they needed to objectify it. So, in other words, they solidified it. And this is where the movement now becomes, it, it reaches the rate of inertia. You see what I'm saying? Whenever you deal with idolatry, you have to understand the, what's happening on the spiritual scientific level. No longer in the experience. So, this means that what Aaron said in, in, in a very interesting way was, was true when he said that these be the gods which brought you all out of Egypt on the, on the level from the, how can you, how you say, the, the, from the idolater, for the idolater, of ancient Egypt for the one who objectified it, this golden calf was the symbol of it. But for the true Hebrew who should have crossed over from death to life, from the lower to the higher, from low degrees to high degrees, you understand, it was an experience. You understand, it was an experience. It was not objectified. But what, therefore, if this is a symbol of it, what is this really a symbol of? What really occurred and what really happened and what is, you know, what is that, um, what is that connection? What is that connection? Let's move some of this out the way right here. What is that connection with this right here? And this is, this is um, the Nibiru, right? This is, this is Nibiru. Right, this is an image of Nibiru. Notice the wings. Notice the horns. You see the horns right here? Now, what's very interesting about this, let's see if we can bring... Um, and, and now, there's a couple other points that are, that are embedded in this. And let's see if we can um, present this. This is also another image which may be true to form of of the golden calf, you know, saying according to, uh, according to um, the ancient Egyptian theology, as you can notice, what is this? And, and have you ever seen a cow or a bull carrying some circular disc? Think about that for a moment. I had to think about this. So wait, have you ever seen that? A circle? Remember, we're told that the ancient Egyptians, we're told by European scholars, that the ancient Egyptians um, did not have the wheel. I, though that, that's a logical fallacy in itself, but we're told that the ancient Egyptians did not have a 
wheel. But then we see in the most ancient of the Egyptian um, art and, and, and religious, you know, religious uh, drawings, you know, we see the circle. You know, we see they had a circle. So how can we assume that they had a circle, a disc, like such as this, but did not have a wheel? How could they, in their theology and science and religion, recognize the sun moved, across, rolled across the sky and, and the dung beetle, and they not have a wheel? So that's, that's false right there. But when have you seen a cow carrying a circle like this in nature, right, in nature? Now, true, primitive people use um, animal anthropomorphic other forms, you know what I'm saying, originally to describe scientific phenomena, to describe psychological phenomena in the... Um, in the degeneration, right, in the, in the perversion and the corruption, which we get as we look at the Bible, we're looking at the latter stages of the ancient Egyptian religion. You know what I'm saying? So this means that the ancient Egyptian religion, in its original sense, was Yahvistic or of Yahweh. But somehow this interpretation became um, solidified or objectified or in the understanding, the interpretation. Remember what it says that Moses was learned in all the wisdoms of the Egypts, right? So that means he understood these things. You know what I'm saying? But the people themselves, not having that understanding, would look upon these things and look at the object and not recognize the aspect that this object is really pointing to. But what's interesting when we look at these sort of images, right, um, the, 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 the calf, the chitcheru, or the Hathor calf right here, we notice this, this red. Notice it's red. It's usually pictured red as Nibiru, also known as Elenine. You also know Planet X is also a red star. You understand? It's, it's, it's a red star. Yet, it also has a companion, very interestingly enough. Now, there is some additional research that's out there that if you can check it out, it goes into some other aspects, and we, 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 we viewed and we've been checking this out um, ourselves. Uh, let's bring this up right here. This is another image of, um, you can see this is another image right here too. Right, this is another image, and now notice this right here that trailing this um, red star, which can't be really seen except in the infrared. Right, NASA has some pictures up there, but interestingly enough, if you go to the NASA website, I think uh, previously it was in Virgo, and it might be in um, um might be in Virgo, in the Virgo constellation. Let me show you this right here. This is what NASA has, and we showed it in the earlier video. NASA actually blocks it out. You know what I'm saying? There's some images that NASA blocks out. But there are pictures of it seen within the, the infrared spectrum. In the infrared spectrum, you are, you are able to see that it is, a, it is a red, you know, it is a red, star and it has this kind of tail right now from the frontal view what's interesting about this image is that from the frontal view this right here would be a a kind of a side view of it right and this right here will be a frontal view the horns are very clearly seen right the horns are very clearly seen could it be that when we look at this particular image and ancient Egyptian um, imagery of of um, of the bull, right? Of of Hathor, Echitcheru, and Isis, and Orset with with these particular horns. That what they actually were picturing, and what was preserved in this was this particular recurring and ancient phenomena. You know what I'm saying? That occurred 
every so many thousand you understand years some say nearly 4000 and you know the um there's different speculations on that but there's a very good um series of uh vids and let's bring that up right here called uh zeta called zeta talk right that goes into you know zeta talk that goes into a little bit more of this so check it out you know check this right here out by right? zeta talk so when you get a chance check out some of the zeta talk vids that we got and it's out there on the internet as well interestingly enough you see this is like one of the kind of you could paint in an ethiopian face and put the traditional ethiopian afro on that and it's just a little interesting thing we wanted to note right there but um this is said to be coming from um the the uh they say the the orion you know the orion um constellation now so you see the the horns here now velikovsky a uh, writer named velikovsky has a series of works um that i think are entitled moses and the 12th uh dynasty literature which um proposes that there it was a Passover comet, that there was a particular Passover comet. And this work is contained in a one named Velikovsky's, Velikovsky's work. And to share a little bit of this, um, let me just share a little bit of this with you right here, that under the calf or the cow or the bull, as it is known that the this placid farm animal, speaking of, you know, the cow, the calf, or the bull, let's let's um um bring that up right here, um, right, this particular farm animal that we know as as um the bull, the cow, the calf, right. Right, this particular animal right here. Um, this particular animal we find very interestingly enough um, is really important. It's an important symbology in both the Bible and in the ancient Egyptian story. So we can't really avoid it even from a biblical perspective. We have Yosef or Joseph. He speaks of the, his, his dream. And Joseph's dream of the of the of the seven cows, or or from the Egyptian perspective, the seven chitcheru or Hathors. Um, his interpretation may be explained also as an astronomical prediction, as a particular prophecy that involved something that was a recurrent um, celestial being. A, a comet that looked from some perspective that must have looked or been likened to a cow, a calf, or a bull. Now, please make a note that when we say the golden calf, remember a calf, and bring this particular image up here, a calf, right? A calf is a... um is a baby is a is a baby bull it's a youngin right the cow is usually the female one the calf is usually the baby one now remember what yahweh says yahweh says i have called my son right i have called my son out of out of egypt right he says i have called my son out of egypt so the cow or the calf, right, the cow or the calf is the baby, yes. all right? Just keep that in mind because uh, this is why we say this is the more accurate, you understand? This is, is probably more likely and more accurate than this because this right here is more like, um, like Hathor or the mother, you understand, the mother symbol. So in a sense... What we might have here, 
if we're correct, what we might have here is the the mother, the father, and the child on a certain on a certain symbolic right on a certain symbolic level, but all of this, what is this pointing to? You, you, have you ever seen a cow carrying something like that on his head naturally? And if the Egyptians thought to put that there, what within nature or phenomena? It must have been something that they saw within nature or that was passed down and put within a, a symbolic story, a parable encoded in simple language so that each generation, even if they were not very literate, that they could carry this on. So the, the symbolism of the cow is very, very interesting, both in the Bible and in the ancient Egyptian stories. Now, here, is, here, here we have this seven cow dream is linked to the later Passover, right? We, it's clear in the Bible story, in the first five books of the Bible, mainly the first two books, that Joseph's, right, seven cow dream, Yosef's seven cow dream, seven Hathors, is clearly linked to what we have later now within the author's telling. Remember, the author of the five books is Moses. So Moses is basically telling everyone's story. It's Moses that is learned in the wisdom of the Egypts, right? And, and he is mighty in word and in deed. So he is an adept of really more than that. He is a master on that level, right? Mo Moses. So he has a master knowledge of this. So he is now presenting to the Hebrews and to the Israelites their story or their mythology or their interpretation, or one can even say reinterpretation or correcting of the interpretation. You know, then once again, taking it out of the idolaters or the image, the, 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 the misunderstood symbolism, and bringing it back to a real-time experience, which now the later Passover is. But now with Moses' absence from the people, the golden calf incident, it becomes as a smoking gun in a sense to say, hey, wait, what is this? Moses is not around, and the people retrograde into this calf thing. And Aaron, who is Moses' prophet, remember Moses was as Elohim. Moses was as God. This is why John says to Moses, you brought them out. Moses, Aaron says to the people that this, this is your God. This is your God that brought you out, the golden calf. So, they, so both must be pointing to something else. There must be some connection with Moses, this calf, in a sense, and in a symbolic way of the story, he is. Remember, the calf is a, a young and a baby one. You understand? Now, the calf, remember, God says that Israel is my son. Moses is the symbolical son in Egypt, the whole in the river, in the Nile story, being drawn forth out of the water, coming, in a sense, out of the womb, and the Nile represents, in a sense, the Milky Way. Remember, the Nile is linked as above, so below with the Milky Way. So we have right here the um, link with the golden calf story. We also have the Egyptian cow goddess known as Hathor. And then Velikovsky, um, Emmanuel Velikovsky, in his Moses in the Twelfth Dynasty um, Egyptian literature writing, he speaks of this comet. He says it could have been Venus, and Venus was interpreted to be um, Astari, Astara, Ishtar, well, from which you get your Easter or Esther, right? Those Egyptians are said to have worshipped or highly regarded the Chit Cheru, the sister of Cheru, the chosen. Cherui is Ethiopic for chosen, the chosen one or the elect in Ethiopic. That word we have as Horus, the root being Ethiopic because the root of the Nile is also Ethiopic, that they worshipped or said to have worshipped the Chit Cheru, they may have been called noble cattle, while those who accepted Re, 
Ray as the ram. Remember, we're also talking about the celestial signs. We're talking about um, changes in the ages, you understand, and those who don't want the new day to come and are doing everything to hold to the old day, similar to where we're at right now with the whole new world order and, and what humanity, this cusp that humanity is on. Some can see a new world and a a new world in which dwells righteousness. Others see their prophets, they're losing their hold on the people and they're doing everything in their power to keep hold. So they're in a the position of the evil Pharaoh. And we who want to go into that new day of true righteousness, you understand where righteousness dwells in the earth, are like the Hebrews, the ones who want to cross over from this darkness into the true light. But as above, so below. So the Egyptians who worship Hathor may have been called the noble cattle. So this use of cattle. Notice how Yahweh uses cattle. You understand that the people become like cattle. You understand? Or even sheeple when they go what? Backward. You understand? Those who accepted a ray or the ram also have been called sheep. So we have these these um these animal identifications because in the real world people understood natural law. So we need to understand what we're seeing in the Bible, not from our cartoon animal experience, because people today have a a, a cartoon version of a, of an animal consciousness. The animals in the cartoons do things and and say things that animals never say. So when you're exposed to that and then you're trying to read the Bible and trying to understand the Bible, you really are lost. You need, in a sense, to be re-educated. You understand? You need to repent and you need to, in a sense, be reborn or approach it, you understand, from a from Yah's perspective, from Jah, you know, forget everything that you know and once again learn the basic the basic principles. Now, the cow as symbol is a symbol of years in Pharaoh's dream, and your Bible is called the king. Now, here the cow is linked with what Velikovsky calls his cow comet theory, which is a kind of very interesting theory. We're not going to go all into it, but that the golden calf has to on the last day of creation. You understand that 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 the golden calf has thought this particular symbol right here, with this red disc right here, the golden calf has thought is connected with the last day of creation, in the sense of the last day of a cycle, which is also identified quite interestingly enough as the day of Passover. Now remember. When Passover occurred, they put the blood on the on the posts of the door in the in the making the doorpost like a phi, like the symbolic phi, the the top lintel, two side posts, and you have that like the Greek phi, right? And that protected those who were within those gates from the what destroyer. Now, what was this destroyer? Remember the darkness. There was that darkness, that, that darkness that preceded this. So we have this link now in, in the ancient Egyptian mysteries. You understand? Because you have to remember that, that if this symbol is a symbol of this, which we call Nibiru, and Ethiopic, Ethiopically, um, Egustar, Egustar, and in the Amharic is called Ereto, or Wormwood, if this really is the link with this, it's no wonder that after about 3,000, roughly 650 or 3,600 or so years, give or take, that if the people from the last recording of this, this uh, orbit of this Ereto, Ereto or Nibiru, or Elanine, or Planet X, that they recorded this and passed this on almost like a parable, like a fairy tale, you understand? But they were trying to warn the people. But, of course, people being people, 
would begin to objectify these particular images. So even though in the ancient writings there is the science you know, of the heavens encoded, the people would approach it as a religion. It's like today, the Bible. Truly, it's spirituality. It's true spirituality, natural leading to supernatural law. But when you approach it as a religion, you see, you see the big difference. When you approach it as a religion, it becomes an empty ritual. So this is what the difference we have now between the Egypt of Musa's, of Moshe's time, right, and the God of the Hebrews, and the fact that Hebrew in itself means to what? Cross over. You know what I'm saying? To cross over. Remember the Nile River Valley, you know what I'm saying, which below reflects above the Milky Way. Remember Moses being drawn out of the Nile River Valley. He's a symbol of sun, the golden calf. The calf is, is the, the child, in a sense, of a cow. Yahweh saying that Israel is his son. He's calling his son out of Egypt. So the symbology is there, but it's all about the correct and the right interpretation in the words it's about the context so the golden calf Hathor is connected with the last day of creation and this can be as Zelikovsky and others have presented their research this can be identified as the day of the Passover so when we look at this particular imagery right here of um, of Nibiru with the horns you see, with the horns, and we saw the side view, the tails. You understand? Because this sort of symbol with a cow with this on it, or, or the cow like this right here, or the cow like that, is where would people in ancient times, understanding ancient how mythology has come about from, from natural things using symbols, like today even people would say so-and-so is a jackass. Why you call him an animal? Why don't you call him a Chrysler, a Chevy, or a Ford? You see, people don't do that. People, you know, so and so is a cow, or like a cat, or a snake. You see, we still do it today. You know what I'm saying? But we don't think that we are somehow primitive, not advanced. We think it's very, it explains exactly. There's something very ancient, very primitive about that. And when one approaches the Bible and don't understand that it's impossible for them to connect the half of the story. So this would have been how, how Nibiru, Ereto, the, the Kokeb of the eighth millennium, so to speak, in previous millennium, would have been seen. Because the thing about this is it's real. It's out there. And it's coming. You understand? Yet... You know, the, the, the government and others continue to deny it as they do right here, as you can see. This is where the, this is the cover up right here. This is how they cover it up. They don't, wanna, they don't want you to see it. Now, notice where it is. You know, it's in Virgo. You see Virgo right there. Virgo is the virgin. You see that there's, there is the connection with or Set or Isis, because in ancient Egypt, the Virgo or the Virgin or the Dingil would have been Or Set, you know what I'm saying, or the Owl Sait, the true woman, right? And now she, and she has her child. Remember, we touched on that with the Kama or the Coma in the constellation, which they replaced with Bernice's wig, which is a whole other story. I call that the Wendy Williams part of the story right there, how they replace, you know, replace the the true symbol of the mother with a woman's wig. You know, you can go figure right there. You know, so some of the things that we're doing is a part of that magic, you know, that has been done. We think it's natural. We think it's the way to go because we are basically under a spell, you know, when one thinks that's the way it is. And this is also another symbol, very interesting. Why would they, you know, what is up with this red, this, this, this red star? You know, people say they worship that. Was it the worship or was it a warning? You know what I'm saying? Was it a warning? Was it a worship or was it a warning? Was it to be objectified and, and idolize, you know, idolatized or was it to be exp recognized in 
nature and in phenomena. So clearly this is a part of phenomena. You know what I'm saying? Because this doesn't happen in a sense every day. It doesn't happen in in in, in the regularity that is known to most generations. Many generations live and so called die, never experiencing, you know, this particular phenomena. But those ancients who did experience it and somehow recognize that it happened before, what was before will be again. Put this there. Now we have the Bible, we have ancient Egypt, we have Revelation, and even now the data from the heavens, even if NASA, the Nahas, the Nahasa, you know, even if they cover it up as they do right here, they black it out. They put it within a black box, right? Now, when we speak of creation, you understand, when we're speaking of uh, creation, we have to note that Musa or Moses, he he wrote the seven-day creation story in Genesis. He is the author of the Hebrew um, Genesis, the Hebrew Genesis. Here the seven days are identified with the seven cows of Yosef. So the seven days that we get in the beginning, right? And then a couple of, you know, ten or so, tw almost 20 chapters or so later, we, you know, we're coming across Joseph. Right, and the seven cows, Moses wrote this. Remember, Acts tell us that he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts. You know what I'm saying? So he understood their wisdom. This is why his his working of um Newman and phenomenon was greater than the 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 priests of the time, because the priests of the time no longer understood this as experience. They no longer understood that as experience. Just like in Christianity, most Christians don't understand living the life of Christ as experience. You see what I'm saying? They can't act in it. It's, 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 it's an image. It's an idol. When I, when I get there, then everything will be all right, and Christ will snap his fingers, and, you know, everything will be, be hunky-dory. No, it doesn't happen like that. You understand? Here, the seven days are identified as the seven cows of Yosef which Moses wrote as a story, as a misale, as a mishle, as a, as, a, as a parable, as a myth. You see, myth originally basically meant a symbolic story, which has a, a deeper or an initiated interpretation to it. It's like trying to understand law or, or science, if you're not already familiar with the terminologies and the reference points. You know, you get confused. It's like reading the Bible, not being familiarized. So this story and this story explanation, it explains this this awesome, this this horrendous uh, celestial events that Moses and the Medeanites, like Jethro, Yotor, and the uh, and his righteous Ethiopian relations, such as the Medeanites, Jethro's father-in-law, they understood this because they still lived in the experience. You understand? They did not objectify as the Israelite, as the, as the, as the Egyptians of that time. And even the Israelites being nationalized, just like Negroes, blacks, and coloreds are nationalized, so to speak, as Americans, but being a Negro, black, and colored is an artificial person, so they were living artificial lives, similar to what was going on with the Israelites, but they couldn't get with the new life, so it was easy when Moses wasn't around to go back to the old life. It's like the old saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play. So Musa, he understood, he tried to convey this in Genesis, in the five books, Torah, he tried to convey this to the uninitiated. He was initiated, but he tried to convey these ideas to the uninitiated and also avoid, you understand, idolatry, avoid the objectifying of it. So trying to explain the true meaning of these objects in, in, in what was of the time probably the scientific and still is a scientific language that we decipher through Talmud, uh, Timherit, through Kabbalah, you know, that we're able to decipher, right? Now, the days, 
these days that are spoken of are the new suns. That is, the earth perhaps was hit, or perhaps the magnetivity of this, you understand, of this particular heavy, heavy, heavy planet, you understand, through the earth off its axis about seven times. Some speculate. And Musa knew of this from his initiate education in both Egypts, both in Egypt where he was the adopted um, son, uh, Pharaoh's daughter's son, and also when he escaped and went to Ethiopia when he was in Median, you understand, with his, his um, Medianite or Ethiopian um, in-laws. This is where now he was able to understand exactly what was wrong, where he was at, and also where he received now from the God of the Hebrews that call to bring his people out. You understand? It was the time, in other words, was right. Now, the seven days of creation, this means that they might have seen this, you understand, or seen the signs of this, and from knowing the interpretation of the mysteries, knew that, okay, if this is going to be done, it got to be done soon. You know, so the seven days of creation are suggested here to be listed as the seven destructions. Some say these are the seven destructions, both in Genesis and Exodus, which Moses both wrote. So Moses wrote of, 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 of probably more than 1,000 generations of activity, coding it, encoding it that occurred before he was born. In other words, the author of those five books is only introduced into the, at the second book. Overstand that. So there's a, the whole book of Genesis. He's not in there, but he is writing the story of the Hebrews or those who were crosses over from the low degrees to the high degrees. So these seven destructions are one: the expulsion from Eden, from the Ganet to Eden, the expulsion from Eden, um, Noah's flood, Abraham's or Abraham's famine the destruction of, of Sodom, Joseph's famine, the Passover, the Fasica Pesach, the destruction of, and lastly but not least, the destruction of Jericho. Yes, the destruction of Jericho, which is interesting. If you look at, if you look at what Jericho means, Jericho, I think, means something like the city of the moon. In other words, um, in, in the name, it has, it's reflective of the moon. So let's 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 note that for right now. Now the reversals of six and seven possibly being poetic license. In other words, the destruction of, of Jericho and the Passover could be poetic license or it could be the retreat of the comet, what's called the comet or Nibiru, Planet X, Reto. We'll, we're going to call it more what the Amharic is, Wormwood in the English. But the retreat of this star, this Kokeb, which became less, became a less dangerous, or less dangerous as it began to move out of, move out of orbit or continue its elliptical um, thousands of years orbit. Now, Solomon. King Solomon also had an experience with the angel of destruction, interestingly enough. And he lost, it seems as though he lost 70,000 um, persons. So um, whether now this was a recurring, a recurring thing or a recurring phenomena, it's very clear that it must have been. And there must have been some way to track this calculate it. So we wonder why the people keep to, like the priests, why would some people keep to these so-called religions or, or, or mysteries or spiritualities? You understand? They were trying to preserve a, a, a warning. You understand? A warning for the remnant, for the faithful, for the, those who could cross over from death to life. Now, one one further point. There's a couple of points, but we're going to um, probably take on this particular point right here, pause for the cause, and come for another part of this, right? But um, let's touch on angel for a moment. Angel, right? Melaach, right? A heavenly being. 
usually a messenger from God. Now, we think of angels today, right? How do people think of angels today? Pudgy, fat, white babies, according to the Western Gentile, according to this end-time Gentile civilization and counterfeit church theology, you know, pudgy, fat, white baby, so forth and so on, right? Or usually people think it take a human form, you know, um, looking somewhat effeminate in some of those old Eurocentric Renaissance paintings. So usually one think of an angel in some so-called anthropomorphic, some some man form, like anthro, man, morphic form, some morpheus, you know, some man form, right? But Originally, scripturally, an angel, a melach, if you look at the, the original context, usually was an, a, a heavenly being, usually a messenger from God, but the connection with the heavens is very, very evident. So a heavenly being, scripturally, it says, what, what you make his, his angels, what, um, flames of fire, right? You know, so you, so you see where the scriptures speak, right, and... Um, however, the original form most likely was not a human form. If we go back to the the so-called primitive, you understand, the original, the root races, take it back, we fade to the black, right? It was not originally a human form. The angel, a heavenly being with a flaming sword, which is the first kind of occurrence, this angel class of angels called uh, a kiru, a cherubim or a kirubim. You know what I'm saying? And the, this word is interesting. Kiru is similar. In Egypt, they'll call it kepra or hepra. Kepra. You know what I'm saying? Which is the so-called dung beetle, which rolled the dung, which they say the Egyptians envisioned that, that there was a beetle which rolled the sun across the sky. Maybe this was not the sun they were talking about. You see, we always think it's the sun that they're talking about. What well, says the moon shall return to blood right here? But we always think it's the sun that they're talking about. Perhaps it is not the sun, but the sun, in a sense, could have been seen by the people as a symbol of this since they've seen the sun more regularly than they've seen this. And whenever they saw this, it was what to woe when they saw this. It's like wormwood in the scriptures, what a woe. And, and that woe came every 36 or so thousand years according to certain um, calculations. So the original form of the angel, we should not look at the original form of the angel as being human-like or always human-like. The first one we see in the Ganetta Aden is that heavenly being that had a flaming sword that they say turned two ways seem to cut two ways, right? A double-edged sword is how it's described in the literature, right? Um, but what is it pointing to? A flaming sword, and this is what expelled Adam and Eve from Eden. And there's, um, it, this is considered to be a type of celestial body. Some might say such as a comet or a kokep, a star, such as Planet X or Nibiru, or from the Amharic Ereto, which will be translated as worm wood. The expulsion or the kicking out, you notice that idea of expulsion, may actually hide the destruction of the wonderful Eden. That when they were so called kicked out of the garden, that just summing it up as they were kicked out. This might be hiding, actually, this, this global or this, this, this destruction that this particular sort of um, a star, a comet, a planet actually did. So we read in the Bible they were kicked out, you understand, and everything went on as usual. No, no, that there was a destruction. That destruction, remember, Adam and Eve are symbolic types. We can say that the Adam and Eve story is basically a parable. It's basically a myth in the sense that it's an ancient primitive story meant to tell a bigger a, a, a bigger picture. But in ancient times, people didn't have all the time to get into all the kind of, you know, stuff that people have right now to write long, exhaustive books, so forth and so on. They had to farm the land. They had to do certain things in a certain time. So they had to sum things up. 
You know, so he summed it up in songs and rhyme and stories. And this is how things passed on down to us. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest mistake many of us make is to think that they were stupid and we shouldn't regard any seriousness to what they said, and we're so wise now. Because the so-called white man or European tells us so, and he denies the true black roots, even though his highest operations are black ops, you know, are black operations. Now, the Passover angel of death, mm-hmm, because the Passover angel, for the Egyptians, the angel of death, for the Hebrews, it was an opportunity. Right, this is considered here to be the same such heavenly being that was sent by God or Elohim to punish mankind or to punish humanity, or we could say to punish the wicked, right? The criminals, you understand, who were who were in violation of his natural law, like humanity today in violation of natural law. This Eden Expulsion, it prefigures, in a sense, in, in, in Genesis, it prefigures the Exodus evacuation mm -hmm. to avoid the similar angel of death. But there had to be an Exodus, a coming out, a, uh, in order to avoid this destruction. In other words, the people had to get together, you understand, to come out before this destruction occurred to be preserved. But it's interesting that the people that were called, as you said at the beginning of this, it was said the God of the Hebrews. It's not the God of Israel at, at, at first. No, he doesn't say the God, it's the God of the Hebrews. Now, what does Hebrew mean? When they were in Egypt, it was the God of the Hebrews.